Everyone, please Morning. stand for our first song. closer to you that we might know you better put our feet on the path that your word might be a light to our path and that you'll put your word in our hearts that we might know it put your word in our mouths that we might tell someone else about it in Jesus name Amen Please be seated Good to see everybody this morning got a couple quick, I don't even think there's really announcements, we've already done that we've been there um Thank everybody for praying for me this last week. I had some hearing, hearing issues the last couple of months. And I had some trauma in my left ear several years ago, so I, I thought it was just my hearing going out because I went through all the rounds of antibiotics and steroids, and the doctor couldn't see any fluid in my ear, so I just thought I was just losing hearing. But I went to the hearing doctor uh, on Tuesday. He said I just needed to get a tube, so I went back on Thursday. He cut it open, stuck a tube in it, and it has helped. He said because up to that point I had 30% hearing loss in my left ear. Just in the matter of a couple of months. So, but as soon as he cut that eardrum open, I could, I could just hear the, the world opened up around me again. But, uh, but he's, he's got that tube. There's still a little kind of, it kind of goes in and out, grogginess, but it, it did help. So, thank you for the prayers, and I, I hope that's that's all there is to it. So it'll heal up here, here soon. So I'll be able to hear all that wonderful singing behind me. I haven't been able to hear it the last couple of weeks. I couldn't hear myself sing either, so I didn't know if I was singing 
too loud or not loud enough, but I didn't care because I couldn't, I couldn't hear myself. So maybe I was singing off key and out of tune, but I couldn't hear it, so it didn't make any difference to me. But, um, hmm? My mic's out. Can't yeah. hear me. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but the mic's not. There's nothing. No. The mic's not coming through. No. Wonderful. Here. That's all right. Everybody can hear me. <laughs> That's all. The, the, uh, Tracy said that she's got some milk in the uh, refrigerator in the back. So before everybody leaves, she's got a, there's a half gallon in the fridge for each family. So before you leave this morning. Um, she got a hold of a, a couple of cases of milk that they can't they can't uh, chug down all themselves. So she came to bless everybody else. So before you leave, please go back to the refrigerator in the kitchen, right through this door, right on the other side of this wall is the kitchen. Uh, she's got to uh, have some some milk for everybody. But that's all the announcements we have. We'll get back to our worship. Is the mic on or can you hear me now? We can hear you, but it's off. No, the mic's not working. Yeah. See, this is what it sounds like. It's got an echo. Echo. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. We're going to go. We're going to continue. <laughs>
If you have your Bible open to John, we'll be in chapter 9. My wireless mic just went out. Can, can you hear me now through this mic back there? Good that it went out before the service. Instead of here in the middle. So we're in John chapter 9. We're going to be covering this whole chapter. You can't really break it down into sections because it's one narrative about this man who was born blind. And we spoke about him briefly last week. It was in the context of needing to hear the word of Christ in order to believe. Because last week we were in Romans 10, really focusing on verse 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. So even though that this man here interacted with Jesus, spoke with him and was even healed by him, he didn't know who Jesus was until Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah to him. And then that's when he believed. He needed to hear the gospel first. That God's Messiah has come to rescue him. And that's the importance of preaching. Because if you don't hear the word, you can't come to faith. So even though you might know who Jesus is, you've interacted with him, you've heard his name, you've seen his name written in the Bible. But unless you heard the word, you can't come to faith. And after all this information is given to this man, he's asked directly by Jesus, Do you believe? Faith comes from hearing. So after hearing the word, after hearing the gospel, a person must be asked then if they believe. It demands a response. You have been given the truth. Do you believe it? And that's why preaching is so important. Expository preaching. That's not coming up here and just telling, it's not story time. Are giving motivational speeches about how good we are, about how good life can be if we do this, that, or the other. We need to hear what God's word says so that after hearing it, we might believe. And if I didn't emphasize it enough last week, I'll do it now. It's not the preacher, it's the preaching. There's nothing special about me. God's word was preached long before me, It'll be preached long after me. It's the preaching. The preaching of his word. There's a lot of churches out there who don't preach God's word. It's just somebody up there talking for 30 or 40 minutes. These are large churches, mega churches. Half of them you see on TV. But they're filled with people who identify themselves as Christians. They have faith, they believe, but the gospel's never preached to them. So 
So what do they believe in? We believe we've been baptized. Well, you, you believe in what? You've been baptized into what? That's the question. Because if God's word has never been preached to you, you've never heard the gospel, then what is it exactly that you believe? The importance of having God's word preached. Because if God's word isn't preached, then people aren't coming to faith. At least not genuine faith. But superficial preaching brings about superficial faith. That's why there's a great need today for Christ-centered preaching. And this man here that's born blind, he doesn't make a real decision for Christ until Christ reveals himself to him. And then he believed. He heard because faith comes from hearing. John chapter 9 verses 1 through 41. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and bathe? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but it is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others says, How can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there is a division among them. So they said to, again to the blind man, What do you say about him? Since he's opened your eyes, he said he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called his parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son? who you say was born blind, then how does he see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and he was born blind. But how he sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. And his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents says, He is of age, ask him. So for a second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, Whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You're his disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as far as this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, You're born, born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, Who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. 
Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. That's a big chunk of 41 verses there, covering a lot of ground, but we have to take it all at once because it's one continuous narrative about this man. So at the beginning, back in verses 1 through 5, it says Jesus passed by. So we have to remember what happened here at the end of chapter 8. He's leaving the temple because at, in the end of chapter 8, there was a group of Jews who said that they believed in verse 30. Many people believed in Jesus, it says. So then Jesus directs his next words carefully to them, in which at the end he professes himself, before Abraham was, I am. Essentially declaring himself to be God to these Jewish people. So this group of people who said that they believed picked up stones to throw at him. Right before Abraham was, I am. Jesus declared himself to be the great I am, the God from the Old Testament. Before Abraham, the God of Abraham. And in verse 30, right, we look at it. And he was saying these things, many people believed in him. In verse 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him. So that didn't last very long, did it? That belief. We believe who you are. We believe in you. And then Jesus revealed himself to who he truly was. And they picked up stones to throw at him. And then I gave, when we covered this here a couple of weeks ago, I gave modern day examples of the same thing that happens today. A group of people who say they believe, we believe. We believe in God. We believe in the scriptures. We believe in Christ and everything that he stands for. But if you stand up and says, well, the Bible says that there's only two genders, male and female, and marriage is, is between one man and one woman, well, then those same believers will pick up stones and cast them to you. How dare you? Who are you to say who I can and can't have a relationship with? Those same group of people who believe, we believe we're in Christ. We believe everything the Bible teaches us. Well, the Bible teaches that homosexuality is a sin. It's an abomination in the sight of God. And you'd be astounded at how many Christians will pick up stones and throw at you for making such a statement. How dare you make a statement like that to tell me what I should believe in? Well, you told me you believe. This is what God's word says. It's the same thing that happened to them. These group of people says they believe. Jesus says, I am God. Well, no, you're not. We're going to throw stones at you. We have the same thing in the church today. We believe in God and we believe in his word. Well, this is what his word says. Well, no, I don't believe that. And they'll throw stones at you. It's not easy being a true disciple of Christ. And that was the whole point in chapter 8, verses 31 through the rest of the chapter. Because in verse 30, people says, we believe in you. So in verse 31, Jesus turns to them. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. And we went over what that means, the word abide. It means to continually remain in. If you're remaining in my word, always, then you are my disciples. So the implication is, if you are not remaining in his word, then you are not one of my disciples. Being a disciple of Christ being a Christian in today's world is difficult. I wish I could stand up here and tell you that it's easy, but it's not. Because true Christianity is in direct opposition to the world. The world and the church have been clashing for years, but there's getting ready to be a head-on collision. The church is getting ready to face severe persecution in these days and months to come. It's already reared its ugly head. Depending on what state you live on, you can't even go worship this morning because they commanded that your church be closed. And I read this morning, and this is in California. John MacArthur, if you're familiar with him, a preacher, he pastors a church in California. 
He went in opposition to that. He says, no, we're going to open up our church. And this morning they sent a notice to him and his church. If you open up your building, the government will turn off the power to your church. This is where we're at right now. This morning, in a state, in the United States of America, if you open up your church for worship, we will turn off your power. The church is about to come under severe persecution. That's the world we live in today. The Kool-Aid everybody drinks today is now social justice. That's the big thing today. With this movement, there's nothing social or justice behind it. This doesn't have anything to do with race, if it ever did. And unfortunately, it's not going to go back to the way it ever was before. It's too late for that. We've come too far now. Every major corporation and entity, every major sports conglomerate has already jumped on board. They've endorsed it. They've endorsed this social justice movement. So you can't go back now. Because if you go back now or if you stand up and says, I'm not getting on board, well, then you're labeled a racist. And they'll come after you next. Just in the last two or three months, the very fabric of this country has completely changed. And it's not going to go back to the way it was before. It's not about race. It's about ideology. This is what we believe. This is how we believe. This is why we believe. And unless you believe that, then they're going to come after you next. If you're an evangelical conservative Christian, you're next on the list because you stand against everything that they're preaching. We're next. The church is next. And it's already showing up. They're closing churches down, threatening to turn off power to the preaching. In Nevada, it came from the Supreme Court, ruled against the church because they wanted to have church. They put a minimum limit on the people who can attend. The church sent an appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court denied it. However, the casinos can still remain open to whatever capacity necessary. But the church must abide by the limits of people who are allowed in the building. This is where we're at. And it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. That's why Jesus says, if you abide, it's not going to be easy. This season ahead of us is going to be difficult because you have to stand firm in what you believe in. And if you stand firm for what you believe in, then you're, going, you're the next target. Jesus tells this group of people who he truly was. We believe in you. I'm the God of Abraham. And they wanted to stone him for it. He's saying not only was he before Abraham, but he is the God of Abraham. And now he's leaving because they want to stone him. And on his way out, he passes this man who was born blind. And his disciples, they ask a question because there's only two reasons. Is it because of this man's sin or because of his parents' sin that he's blind? This was a common belief at the time. It's a common belief today that if I'm sick or if there's something wrong with me, then it's because of sin. And sometimes that is the case. But it's not the case with this man. And it's not always the case with us. Am I suffering because of something I've done? Why doesn't God help me? Why doesn't he cure me? How come he doesn't do anything for me? The age-old question, why does bad things happen to good people? We continually ask ourselves, why me? How come God doesn't help me? Why does he allow me to be sick? 
Why did he allow my loved one to pass? Here a while back, I can't remember who it was, but I'm sure it was Bodie Bachman. He's a preacher, an outstanding preacher. And he covered this topic. And what he said was a great answer. And I can't add anything better to it, so I'm going to tell you what he said about it. When we ask that question, you know, well, how come God doesn't do more for me? Why does he let bad things happen to good people? When we ask it that way, we're putting ourselves above God. Why me? Why isn't God doing more for me? What we're doing there is we're making supremacy of man, and we put God down here. We're God's creation. He should be doing more for me. He should be helping me. These things shouldn't happen to me. But what Bodhi says here is we're asking the wrong question. It should be flipped the other way around. We should be asking, why does God ever do anything for me? Why did God even allow me to wake up this morning? Because of how sinful I am. We should have the supremacy of God up here, not the supremacy of man. Why doesn't God just crush me? Because he knows everything I've ever done. He knows every lustful thought I've ever had, every angry thought, every murderous thought I've ever had and ever will have. So why does he even allow me to exist? That's the question we should be asking. Not why doesn't God do more for us? Why does he even allow me to exist in the first place? Because of my wickedness. Like Paul says, all the things I should be doing, I don't do. All the things I know I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing them all the time. That's each and every one of us. So why does God even allow me to continue? And it's because of grace. It's because of mercy that God does these things. It wasn't because of this man's sin or his parents' sin. It's just because of sin. We live in a fallen world and part of that fallenness is sickness and disease and it's death. Jesus responds by saying, it's so that the works of God might be displayed in him. When we read that, what we hear is, I purposely made this man born blind so I could come across to him today and heal him so that you could see. But that's not what Jesus meant. It's not because of his sin or his parents' sin. It's just because that's just the way it is. We live in a world where sickness and disease exist. But what Jesus is saying, regardless of that fact, God can still demonstrate his mercy in the midst of this man's suffering. Despite this, God can still manifest his glory. So why doesn't God just crush us? Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, but God, Paul begins a lot of sentences in his letters like that because what comes next is a demonstration of God's majesty. But God, it should be on the slide. Keep going forward. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us, Right? Those two words for love. Anytime in scripture we get two words back to back that are the same thing, it's for emphasis. There's no other word in the human language that Paul could put here to demonstrate how much God loves us. The great love which with he loved us. It reminds us of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We know that scripture. We hold fast to it. We believe in it because that's what we put our faith in. But we never fully comprehend it. And we never can in this life. Sit and think about it. How much does God love us? That he sent his son to suffer. To be humiliated. To step down from glory. 
to put on flesh, to take our place, to be scourged and whipped, to be spit on, slapped and hit, and then nailed to a cross. Love. That's a love that we'll never be able to comprehend that God stepped down from the throne to put on flesh, to take our place on the cross. Why? Because we're so good? Because we're so great? Because we try real hard and we do everything, we're so holy, we're so righteous, we do everything that God wants us to do? No. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. That's the same as Romans 5, 8. Another sentence that begins with, but God. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were so great and so holy and so righteous. No, while we were still in active rebellion against God, Christ died for us. Because he's rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us. But God, it can all it means because of, because of God. He's rich in mercy. That's why. But God demonstrates his love for us. That while we were still sinners, we always think of ourselves in better light than what we really are. When we read through the gospel and we get to the end of John, John's the only disciple who came back during the crucifixion. We like to think of ourselves as John. We were there in the end. We claim to that cross as our Lord was hanging from it. No, that's not what scripture tells us. Scripture tells us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We weren't the ones clinging to the cross. We were the ones in the crowd mocking Jesus. You save so many, save yourself. Come down from that cross, then we'll believe. We're the ones who spit on him as he was carrying the cross down the road while we were still sinners. When Christ prayed from the cross for these Pharisees who were mocking him, he was praying for us. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was a prayer for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's why we can never understand the love because God is rich in mercy. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ because of grace you have been saved. God's unmerited love and grace is why he allowed us to wake up this morning. And if it stopped there, it'd be wonderful, but it doesn't. It goes on. Not only that, we've been saved, we've been raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places next to Christ Jesus. Not only are we saved, we're raised to new life in heavenly places, seated next to Christ, shoulder to shoulder at the same table because we receive the exact same inheritance as he does as adopted children of God. And it even goes further. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, not only did he make us alive together, he seated us next to Christ so that in the age to come he might show immeasurable riches of more grace and more kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For grace you have been saved through faith, and not by your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of your own works, that any man should boast. So why doesn't God just crush us or give us what we truly deserve? Because he's rich in mercy. When we ask the right question, Instead of, how come God doesn't do this for me? When we ask the right question, then we get the right answer. And God did this for this man to display his light in a darkened world 
As long as he is with us, he's the light of the world, we're told. Amen. And those who were blind, they will now see. Their eyes have been opened to who he truly is. And they can see because they've been exposed to the light. Their eyes have opened to the truth. And if you know the truth, we're told in chapter 8, and the truth will set you free. Free from darkness, free from spiritual blindness. That's the whole irony against chapter 9. It's in direct contrast with chapter 8. With all the people who said we believe, but then they wanted to cast stones at Jesus. And here in chapter 9, it took a blind man to see who Jesus really was. That's the moral of the story in chapter 9. It took somebody who was blind to see Jesus. Because Jesus presented himself. Do you believe? Because this is who I am. And the man said, I believe. He didn't pick up a stone. He fell and worshipped. In verses 6 through 8, Jesus puts mud on his eyes. Tells him to go wash off. A chance for this man to demonstrate his faith. Jesus gives a command to him and he follows it. And it's with little doubt that this man has heard of Jesus before. Jesus, this is now towards the end of Jesus' ministry. He's been in Jerusalem before. And you don't do the things that Jesus does or say the things that he does and not know about him in Jerusalem. So undoubtedly this man has heard who Jesus was. In verse 11 he knows his name. He knows who did this to him. He knew it was Jesus. And I'm sure that he knew that Jesus was a healer. So when Jesus says, go wash your eyes off, he acted in faith, and he went and done so. He went away blind. Or better yet, it says he was sent away. The pool of Siloam. It means sent. To be sent. Jesus sent him away blind, and he came back seen. Just like that. By the grace of God. In one verse, he goes away blind, comes back seen. In verses 8 through 17, the man's brought forward. First, it's just the people interrogating him, and then the Pharisees begin interrogating the man. In verse 11, right, who did this for you? And the man called Jesus. At first, Jesus was just a man. This is his steps towards faith. He knows he's healed. He knows Jesus did it. But the man Jesus healed me. He was just a man, a man who could make blind people see. And the Pharisees took issue with that because this happened on the Sabbath. How dare God demonstrate his love, compassion, and grace and mercy on the Sabbath? We don't allow that around here. He can't be of God or from God because he did this on the Sabbath. We forbid it. Therefore, he's a sinner. For some, when God displays his majesty, it leads them to faith. For others, it leads them to towards further unbelief because it disrupts their whole way of life and they have to make a decision so they rather not decide why did Jesus heal the man we're told in verse 3 that God might God's works might be displayed in him God's works leads people to faith and drives others further away. The argument begins of how can this man who does these things be a sinner? Because only a man of God could do these things. And some people could see that, and others couldn't. So the true de debate here is who's really the blind? Who's really the blind ones here? That's the question that were asked in this whole chapter. Who's truly blind? Who truly sees? So the Pharisees are asked about him. He asked the, asked the man again, what do you say about this man? In verse 17, 
the man who was formerly blind begins to see even more clear. Jesus is now a prophet. He must be a prophet of God before he was a man. But after this conversation that claimed, how can a man do these things if he were not from God? That hit the heart of the blind man. That's true, I agree. He can't just be a man to do these things. He's sent from God, so he must be a prophet. It took a blind man to see who Jesus was. While all this time, he's surrounded by these men of God, quote, unquote, who couldn't see Jesus at all. After everything that he's said and done, they still couldn't see. In verses 18 through 34, they interview his parents. And they were afraid to say anything because they'd get kicked out of the synagogue. That was a big thing back then. We ought to remember this is, this, this is the church and state together. Everything was surrounded around temple worship. If you were kicked out of the synagogue, you were no longer a part of the people. You couldn't participate in anything. You were an outcast. The parent says he's old enough. This wasn't a child. He's a grown man. If you want to know how he was healed, go ask him for yourself. He's old enough to answer on his own. So they call the man in the second time. And they say, give glory to God in verse 24. We know that this man is a sinner. They're not asking him to praise God or give the glory to God. This is what's called a... a Jewish oath. It's an equivalent to a Jewish oath. And you can cross-reference that in Joshua 17, 7, 19. We don't have time to turn. You can look at it later. Joshua 7, 19. It's a formula they use. Give glory to God. It means, I put in you, before God is your witness. This man is a sinner. Now say it. Under oath. And the only oath that this man could give was, before I was blind, and now I see. That's all I know. That's the only oath under God that I can give you. And now the man who was born blind wants to open the eyes of the Pharisees. In 27 through 29. When they ask him, how do you do this to you? He answers, I've already told you. You wouldn't listen. Why do you want me to tell you again? It's because you want to become one of his disciples now? You're his disciple. We're disciples of Moses. That's the most accurate thing that the Pharisees ever said in the gospel. We're not his disciple. You are. And it proves to be true. This man was a true disciple. In verse 30. Right as they go up, you're, you're a disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We don't even know where this guy comes from. The blind man in verse 30, he's astonished at this. Why? How can you not know where this man comes from? This is an amazing thing he just did. How can you not know? After everything that Jesus has said and done, how can you not know where this man comes from? God doesn't listen to sinners. In verses 32 through 33, never in the history of the whole world was a man born blind, lived half his life, and then somebody healed him. Ever. That's never happened. How can you not know where this man comes from. If Jesus is not from God, he could not do these things. Even a blind man could see this. And then they criticize him for having the audacity by trying to teach them anything. How dare you teach me anything? You're born in sin. And they cast him out of the temple. They throw him out but God. 
God stepped in. In 35 through 38, Jesus finds this man and he tests his faith. Do you believe in the Son of Man? That's the question. Who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? You've seen him. It's he that's speaking to you. Lord, I believe. And then he worshipped him. They kind of have a direct contrast there in verse 36. In the most in the ESV that I have here, it says, and he answered, sir, the words, the Greek word kyrios, it can be translated a number of ways. And sir, it can be sir, master, lord, little l, lord, capital L. It's translated correctly here. The first time he answers, sir. It's just a polite word. And more times than not in the New Testament, that's how it should be translated. Because not everybody is walking around calling Jesus Lord, capital L. Even his disciples didn't truly know who he was until after the resurrection. So he's just giving him a polite answer. Who is he, sir? John's given a play on words. In one verse, he's sir. Jesus presents himself to him as the Messiah, the Son of God. And now he calls him Lord. It's the same Greek word. He went from sir, polite sir, to Lord, I believe, and worship. He believed and worshiped him. That's the final stage of belief. The final stage of faith is worship. To fall down and worship. That's how we know we're true believers. Because we worship. The Greek word for worship is proskuneo. It means to fall down to your knees. It means to fall prostrate on your face. That's what worship means. So in the middle of the temple, in the middle of this crowd of hundreds and hundreds of people, this man falls to his face at the feet of Jesus. The feet of the man they were just wanted to stone a few minutes before. Do you believe? After Jesus reveals himself to the man, the man falls down on his face and worships him. At the end of chapter 8, that group of people who believed picked up stones to throw at Jesus when he presented himself as the Messiah. This man fell down and worshiped. That's how we know our faith is true. For all the people who said that they believed, it was only the blind man left standing. Or better yet, he was left prostrating himself on his face before the Lord Jesus. That's what true worship looks like. That even though the world around him criticized him, cast him out of the temple, he was not afraid to worship his Lord. And there's going to come a time when we're going to have to make that same decision in front of God and everybody as our witness. We're going to be asked, do you believe? And we're either going to cast stones so we can fit in with everybody else or we're going to say, I believe. And we're going to fall down and worship our Lord. We're all born into this world blind to the truth. It's not until our eyes are open that we can see Jesus for he truly is. That's the contrast in chapter 9. The man was born blind. Jesus opened his eyes. He saw who Jesus was and he worshiped. Verses 39 through 41, Jesus says, I didn't come to judgment as I wrap up here. Going over a couple of minutes. Back in John chapter 3 and 17, God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. But he did bring judgment with him. I mean, I don't want to paraphrase it. I want to read it. 
Back to John chapter 3. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, for he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Verse 19, this is the judgment, it says. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their works were evil. And then over in verse 36 in chapter 3, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That's the judgment. Christ brought judgment into the world. You reject him. That's the judgment. And the wrath of God remains on you. He brought judgment into the world. He just hasn't executed it yet. But there's going to come a time when everybody will have to stand and make a plea for the decisions they made. And then he has a conversation with these Pharisees about being blind. Jesus says that if you were blind and the truth was revealed to you, then you'd have no guilt. But since you say you see, because what you're saying is, is that I see. I see the Bible. My eyes are open. So if you can see God, you can see Jesus, you can see his word, and you still reject him, then your guilt remains, is what Jesus tells him. If you, think, if you say that you see, then you're saying that you see me, and you're standing right here rejecting me, in front of everyone. Your guilt remains. You are still under judgment. Many people say they believe in Jesus. But when he truly re reveals himself, they pick up stones to throw. Because sometimes that truth is too much to bear. Because people will criticize us and persecute us for it. We'll lose friendships. Family won't talk to us anymore because of what we believe. They want a Jesus that's created in their own image. The God who conforms to the culture and to the world. Not a God who condemns the world. No, they want a God who conforms to the world because a God who condemns the world condemns them. We can't have a God that condemns us. Therefore, we create a God in our own image who likes all the things that we like and agrees with all my opinions. The world is coming after our faith and they will demand that you fall and worship the God that they've created you worship their agenda and their ideology or else or else we're coming after you you're next on our list but if you stand firm in your faith they will pick up stones and throw at you it's in those times that we remember Paul's words in Ephesians 2 4 through 9 but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which with he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved you've been raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus for grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it's the gift of God not a result of works that no one should boast let's pray Father we thank you for the time that we have to preach your word we pray that you'll give us the strength to stand firm for what we believe in when we get put in those positions or we're going to have to make a choice. Give us the strength to choose you. Regardless of the persecution and the stones that are getting ready to come casting our way. Let us hold firm in your word, firm in our faith. Because we know that those who abide in your word, those are your disciples. And that being rich in your mercy, 
you will raise us up and seat us with Christ and you will demonstrate your love with us with those immeasurable riches that you have waiting for us in that coming age. Father, we praise you and we thank you. We seek to honor and glorify you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. You've never come to that time in your life where you've given your life to Christ. You don't abide in his word. You're ready to give your life to him. We pray that today is that day. If you have any questions about salvation or baptism or anything like that, I'll be in the back as we sing this last song. Don't forget, before you leave today, uh, Tracy's got some milk for everybody in, in the refrigerator back there. Uh, so just remember before you take off. So everybody, please stand as we worship through song one more time. I should.